Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Looking Up. We have been kind of out of pocket for the last few weeks, but we're excited to be back together staring at one another's faces. Um, and we are just a podcast for Christian women, and we enjoy getting together and talking about things that are important to us because we feel like they're most likely important to other Christian women. And today we have an encouraging topic that we'll get to in just a minute. But I am back in Texas, and Kathy, my friend, your other host, is in Kentucky, in Bowling Green, Kentucky, and uh, we are glad to get together and see one another again. How are things over there in your neck of the woods? Uh, they're great. I really have missed this. I find it ironic that while we were on the Mediterranean cruise, we were able to record three times mm-hmm. <laughs> while we're out of the country. And somehow the first week that we're back, we just can't pull it off. We could not do oh, it. Oh man. Yeah. <laughs> well, both of us kind of had little bugs going on and yeah. we were driving back from Colorado to Texas and you're mm-hmm. trying to get back things going on the farm again. So yes. yeah, and we just had to skip. You had big news. I do. I think we should just right out of the gate, start off with that. We have a grand, brand new grandbaby, a little girl. Her name is Darcy Janes. She was born on Monday. This is Thursday. She was born Monday at about noon, a little afternoon. And she was a little over seven pounds and she is beautiful. She's got her daddy's black hair and uh, we've got five other grandchildren who all came out with blonde ish hair. So it's, it's been fun for me to see this one. It reminds me so much of Jake when he was a baby, but uh, she's doing well. I think that their, the birth experience was, you know, as it goes, it wasn't too bad. And uh, Alyssa is recovering well, and we're just very thankful to God for a safe delivery and excited to see how she grows. It was fun we were there. We went up uh, Sunday afternoon so we could take care of her big sister, Turner, while the birth was going on. And so we got to be there when Turner saw her for the first time. Um, yeah, this was fun because Aww. I woke her up from her nap and got her in the bath real quick because I wanted her to, you know, look nice for the pictures that I knew were going to happen. And she was not too excited about going straight from a nap to the bath. So that was interesting. But um, they have a there. It's a two level home. And so Jake wanted us to keep Turner upstairs while they brought Darcy in and got her kind of on the table and spread. You got this camera set up. And and uh, so John brought Turner down and I was walking behind them and the staircase goes down and then there's a landing mm-hmm. that overlooks the living room and then it goes down again. And Turner went down by herself and she stopped on the landing and she squealed when she saw her mom and daddy. And then she just stopped. She was like a in her tracks, stopped in her tracks because she could see the baby that was on the coffee table. They had put her in this little pillow thing. And she squealed again and said, baby Darcy, it comes out like Bay Darcy, Bay Darcy. And uh, ran downstairs and just jumped on the coffee table. And, and she was so excited. And then she oh, cried, dude. you know. It just kind of, it got to her. It's like, what are all these emotions I'm feeling? But Aww. anyway, it was fun being there and she's doing well. And, and, uh, I mean, Turner's already over the whole emotion thing. She's every time the baby cries, she would, is she okay? Kind of stuff. But anyway, it's all good. Everything's good. I am so glad they held off until you got back in the country. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> because they did uh, go to the hospital one time when mm-hmm. was the last day of the cruise. And yeah, I remember telling you that I think I cried, which is really very selfish of me to be <laughs> sad that I wasn't there when it was when I thought it was going to happen. But anyway, she managed to wait till we got home. Yeah, I'm so glad. Yeah. Congratulations. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. It's an exciting thing. I have some more good news. What's that? Oh, my back gloves. Yay. I'm so glad. So excited. Yeah, it was a kind of an interesting way of finding it because we were in the car again with Turner and she wanted a cracker. So I had taken one out of the package and I was turning around to give it to her in the back seat. And when I did, it broke and it fell down into the between the seat and the console. And so I stuck my hand down in there and I was feeling around and then I felt something and pulled it out. And there it was. I mean, I went looking for it there and just I guess I didn't put my hand in the right place, but it was dirty. I had to clean it up. But anyway, I'm so, glad. so you'll find yours eventually. It'll show yeah, up. Yeah, I just need to drop a cracker in my car or something. Uh, or in your house somewhere. <laughs> 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 yeah. So it's been going on there. How's Peaches well, readjusting to Motley Meadows again? 
she's doing really well. We're getting more milk from her than we have been. And um, it, when we first got back, you know, we didn't have any milk and we had to go to the store and buy some. The first and that time felt in so wrong mm-hmm. <laughs> to the store. We're looking at the milk and we're just looking at each other like, I can't believe we're doing this. <laughs> <laughs> So, well, I'm glad me. that um, yeah, well, we, she started putting out milk again. Yeah. Well, no, yeah. I guess she did. And Jeremy kept it, huh? Well, I don't think he kept mm-hmm. it. I think he just mm-hmm. dumped it out. But mm-hmm. so we didn't have any here. And mm-hmm. so um, we're glad to have that back. And I was able to collect enough cream to make butter yesterday and, you know, kind of getting back in the groove of things. But yeah. now with the time change, it's getting darker earlier. So it's Mm -hmm. shifted our schedule and we're having to bump things back a little bit earlier and, you know, um, dark in the morning when we go out dark in the evening when we nurse. So it's a little Mm. bit different beast milking right now. And, and the other news with that is that, um, I found out I'm allergic to hay. (laughs) Really? How'd you find that out? Well, Neil, Went out of the country, or not went out of the country. Neil left town, and I was taking care of peaches all by myself. And usually, he's the one that goes and grabs the hay bales and all that kind of stuff when we need it. Well, I was doing it, and when I would grab alfalfa hay or whatever, I noticed I started getting rashes on my forearms. Hmm. And I really didn't think very much of it because it didn't hang around very long. Well, then I started noticing that every time I went into the barn, I started sneezing, my eyes started itching. And I started developing a rash on my left eyelid, um, Mm -hmm. on my forehead, on my neck. And it, um, the one on my eyelid almost started looking a little bit like eczema, which I've never had in my life, but it kind of felt that way, looked Mm -hmm. that way. And, um, so anyway, I thought I'm, I'm having some kind of allergic reaction to something. Well, when we went on the Mediterranean cruise, it cleared up and went away completely. Mm -hmm. And then as soon as we got back and I went out in the barn again, it all came back with a vengeance. Mm -hmm. And so now I have to wear safety goggles (laughs) in the barn to protect my eyes. And because it's, it's kind of, it's airborne. It's kind of a, I get both. I get the, the sneezy Mm -hmm. watery eyes and then I get the the rash. Yeah. Yeah. So I have to put a, like a hoodie over my hair to protect it from my hair. It's safety goggles on my eyes. I have to wear long sleeves and gloves. And so way back when, when I was daydreaming about what it would look like to be a little dairy maid. Yeah. It was like. not this. Uh-huh. It was not safety goggles and a beanie. You know? yeah. Well, I may be asking a dumb it's question, but the, are there other types of hay that you yes, might not in be allergic fact, to? I ended up posting about it and I'm in these homesteading groups. I ended up Mm -hmm. posting about it, asking if anybody else has had trouble with it. And this one lady said that she has the same problem and where they buy their hay, their feed store changes out their suppliers. So Mm -hmm. she doesn't react the same way to the hay every time. And she Mm -hmm. said she can always tell when it's poison hay, which is what she calls it by how she reacts. And when they get that kind of hay and she has to have her kids, you know, handle it and Mm. she can't be around it. So I'm hoping that when we go through all of this hay and we get our next batch in, we'll get it Mm. from somebody different and maybe I won't react the same way, but I don't know. It may just be. I know that's a big deal for you. Yes. I mean, to be able to go out and not have to worry about that would be huge. Yeah, it would. So (laughs) now I, I always feel like I always have a lot to remember anyway when I go out there and now I have to remember, cover my hair, cover my arms, cover my eyes, bring Mm -hmm. Kleenex because I'm sneezing and my nose starts. You just shove them up your nose and wear them that way. I should do that also. Safety goggles, tissues up my nose. I'll send pictures. (laughs) Yes. I definitely need a picture of that for sure. Well, but I guess the long sleeves, that'll be easy since it's winter coming up. Mm And yeah, like you said, dark, did you see that somebody sent around a meme? I saw it or maybe a GIF, whatever it is that said, um, it's time to turn my my clock from, from joy and happiness to sorrow and depression. (laughs) I mean, I love the time change when it happens in the spring, but Mm -hmm. when it happens in the fall, you get an extra hour of sleep sort of, but Mm -hmm. 
that dark. That really gets me. I know we've had that conversation before, but yes, I don't really care for it. Well, but on a brighter note, Saturday night is our baby shower for, for Amara. Mm -hmm. Um, the little Your baby new granddaughter. girl that yeah, Carl and Emily are going to have. So I get to shop. I haven't done it yet, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. but I get to go shopping for girl stuff. <laughs> mm-hmm. <That's laughs> so fun. weird. Yeah, it's fun. When is yeah. she due? March 20 something. Okay. So mm-hmm. it will be at the beginning of the daylight and rejoicing and joy mm-hmm. when the light turns around again. Yes. Well, that's exciting. Yeah. yeah girl so- clothes are a lot of fun. Oh man, it's just so strange. It's been all boys in the part. Our mm-hmm. we had three boys and we had two grand grand boys. So yeah. this yeah. is so new, so exciting. Yeah. yeah, it is. Well, I wanted to share something that um that I it's for the scripture writing, but mm-hmm. I thought I would share it here first. It's the cover for oh. next year's scripture writing book. Oh, and I know real. if you're listening to this, you won't be able to see it. So you'll have to turn on the, the YouTube version and see, mm-hmm. but this, I'm really excited about it because Paige Waddell did it. It's Jeremy's mm-hmm. cousin-in-law, right? Because yes. Jeremy and Corey are cousins. Wife. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So Paige is a watercolor artist She's and I had so asked her, she is very talented. She does um, custom home portraits, which I had never heard of before. And I think it's mm-hmm. kind of unique to her. I've never known anyone else to do it but she does portraits of of homes like like you could have had one done of your house in Colorado if you were you know wanting to remember the way it looked whatever we had her do one for my aunt who moved from her home that she lived in in Atlanta for 40 something years and then our kids had her do one of John's parents home and they gave it to us for Christmas not too long ago so it's a really neat idea. But anyway, <clears throat> excuse me, she did the cover and I'm I'm working right now on having it put in, into the book. I've been working on the book and hopefully we'll have that ready around Thanksgiving. But here is the cover and it's just so pretty. Oh, that's beautiful. Yeah, I'll pull it up a little oh. bit closer. But I just told her kind of what I wanted and and not really any details. I just knew that she'd be able to kind of figure out what I love the you colors. know, it's, it's got a road that kind of makes you think about, you know, taking off into the future. And just, mm-hmm. it reminds me a lot of a, a certain, it's a, one of the meadows in Rocky Mountain National Park mm-hmm. that we always love to there. visit. So anyway, I'm excited about it. And that will be out soon. Should be out. She my Thanksgiving. did a great job. She did. It she looks did. good. How yeah. exciting. Well, I know you have things that you've got to get to before darkness descends upon Motley mm-hmm. Meadows. So I did can... want to share one more thing. Okay. Um, I know you and I have seen this and we've already talked about it, but I wanted to give a little shout out to this new podcast that we've oh, seen yeah, everybody yeah. Uh-huh. sharing and talking about. Um, mm-hmm. It's called Sisters Podcast. It looks really good because it's for young women. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think it's sponsored by House to House and Heart to Heart. Uh-huh. So, um, but the young ladies are Jada Ware, Lois Webster, Lydia Rebelski, and Brie Neighbors. And Brie is a friend of Emily's. Um, oh, she was okay. in her wedding. And, mm-hmm. but um, it's coming in January. I think all four of these ladies spoke at PTP this year. I think I'm not 100% yeah. sure about that, but um, just wanted to. I'm sure everybody is, if you're on social media at all, you've seen it because yeah, yeah. they've been um, promoting it and they have this gorgeous picture of the four of them together mm-hmm. on the couch and looks really yeah. beautiful. And so I know that'll be a really good resource and an uh, encouragement for Christian women also. Yeah, absolutely. I know Lois and I think I've met Lydia, but I don't know the other two, but I know mm-hmm. that um, the four of them, that, that'll be fun. It'll mm-hmm. um, be a younger I'm sure a way of looking at things and you and I have older mm-hmm. married uh, different experiences. And, and I think it's yeah. going to be great for the, for the kingdom. So that's good. Yeah. Glad you yep. thought to bring that up. Okay. All right. Okay. So today we're going to talk about encouragement and we kind of, when we were, you and I were talking about it amongst ourselves, um, we thought we'd call it being a Barnabet. And I asked you if you thought it was cheesy, cause it is a little cheesy being a <laughs> Barnabet, but um, it is, kind of fun just to think about um, how we can be encouragers like 
Barnabas was to the early church and to to Saul, Paul. And um, so I wanted us to talk today about ways that we can encourage one another and how we can be mentors, how we can lift others up with our words, with our deeds, and um, just our our mindset, the, the people that we are. So I did a little bit of study about Barnabas and looked at all of the verses that that talked about Barnabas because his name means son of encouragement. So I think Barnabet must mean daughter of encouragement. Don't you think Absolutely. it's got to mean that mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. it's got to be in some Bible dictionary somewhere. Yeah. I'll find it someday. We'll find it. Yeah. So there's several passages that, that talk about him and, you know, you can look through your Bible and, and read these, but uh, Acts 4 36 talks about um, Bar. I think that's the first time that he's brought up. And it says that um, it, it calls him Joseph here, Joseph, a Levite of Cyprian birth, which is ironic because we were just in Cyprus not too long ago. Uh, mm-hmm. He was also called Barnabas by the apostles, which translated means son of encouragement or son of exhortation or son of consolation. And um, and then another passage that I thought really spoke a lot about him was Acts 9, 27. <clears throat> Excuse me. And this says, Barnabas took hold of him and brought him to the apostles and described to them how he had seen the Lord on the road and that he had talked to him how at Damascus he had spoken out boldly in the name of Jesus. So it's talking about when, you know, when Saul, when Jesus appeared to Saul on the road to Damascus and he was taken into Damascus and he was without sight. And then Ananias went to him and helped to explain uh, Jesus to him and, and, you know, you can imagine what it was like for people who knew Saul to begin with and how he mm-hmm. terrorized the church, the early church, and drug people to prison and just did all kinds of terrible things to them. And so, you know, you think about someone like that showing up in your local congregation, how frightening that would be. Mm-hmm. But Barnabas, it says that he took hold of him. And so if you if you look into that word, took hold and you look all the different ways that it's used in scripture. It it literally means to grab hold, to touch, because there's a lot of times that's used in scripture talking about Jesus when he healed people and and he actually touched them. He, He took their arm or touched their eyes or whatever it was that he did. But it says that Barnabas took hold of Saul and brought him to the apostles. And so I was thinking in a way of how this son of encouragement and how we can do the same thing, take hold of people, maybe not seize them physically, but, but when we, you know, take hold of someone that needs to be, um, that we need to help facilitate ways that other people see them. So that's one way that I think Barnabas helped. It says that he brought Saul. So not only did he take hold of him, he brought Saul. And sometimes we need to do things like that to help other people. And then um, there's there's lots of, of ways that we can be like Barnabas. And Acts 11.22 is another one. And that says that uh, the news about them reached the ears of the church at Jerusalem and they sent Barnabas off to Antioch. So it's talking about in Antioch how the church news had spread and the church had grown in Antioch. And um, so the church at Jerusalem sent Barnabas there to Antioch. When he arrived and witnessed the grace of God, he rejoiced and began to encourage them all with resolute heart to remain true to the Lord, for he was a good man full of the Holy Spirit and faith. So he was so excited to see the growth of the church there in Antioch, and he rejoiced and encouraged them. So um, there's other passages that talk about him. I don't want to spend all of my time talking. You have things to say too. Uh, But there's places in Acts 14 where uh, he and Paul were at Lystra and they tried to praise him and, and they called him, I can't remember one of them, Paul, they called Zeus and, and Barnabas Hermes, or maybe it was one of one of the other, but it says that, that Paul and Barnabas tore their garments and they didn't want to be lifted up on a pedestal. So we know that he was a a humble man. You know, he didn't want to bring glory to himself, but only glory to God. And it goes on to say that he went on strengthening and and encouraging the people there. Um, In Acts 15 too, it talks about he debate, how he debated with Judaizing teachers. So he was not a pushover. He was a strong man. 
uh, Acts 15, 25 calls him beloved Barnabas. So, you know, he had to have been someone that, that was loved. And um, you think about people who are encouragers in your life and how much you love and adore them and what a difference they make in your life. So you can just imagine how people saw Barnabas then. Um, he's the one that took John Mark, you know, Paul and Barnabas had a disagreement over John Mark at one point about whether or not he was useful. And Barnabas obviously saw the good in John Mark and wanted to take him and, and use him. Um, so those were some of the things that I, some of the passages that I looked at. Did you need to add anything to that? I want to add anything to that. <clears throat> uh, no, we don't ever talk about these ahead of time. Right. And we both pretty much did the exact same thing. I have printed off yeah. the same passages <laughs> and the, the things that you pointed out <clears throat> um, took him and brought him and told them. I highlighted all three mm -hmm. of those phrases. Um, the only verse I added that you didn't mention was in Acts 13. Um, and that's where he is at that point serving with the church at Antioch. And it says that he was set apart for the work mm -hmm. with Saul. Um, but the other ones, uh, I had pointed out the same exact verses and kind of what the direction that I went was just from those texts in the same ways that he was an encouragement to others. How can we encourage mm -hmm. others? So I think we'll kind of, I think that'll kind of come up naturally as we just talk about it. Yeah. The words that I thought would describe him, first of all, the first one that I came up with, of course, was encourager and then facilitator and teacher. So <clears throat> when you think about someone being a facilitator, does that do you how do you do you see that what I'm thinking of as far as him facilitating things with Saul and Paul mm -hmm. and how maybe you've had to do that or needed to do that or have done that in the past with other people. I know people have done it for me. Mm -hmm. When you have someone new in a congregation that doesn't know anyone, you can facilitate their getting to know other people. Mm -hmm. um, someone that's a go-between. And I thought about all of the, the people who are rejected out there, the people who are feared because maybe they're a little bit different and how, mm -hmm. how can we how can we facilitate their getting to know other people? How can we facilitate others seeing them differently? And that's what I thought we would talk about for a little while. Mm -hmm. um, think about Saul again, going back to what we were talking about a minute ago and how, if you had seen someone like that, that you'd, you'd heard of all of the bad things that he had done and he walks in the door of your congregation and he's with, with someone that you know to be a good man, how, I mean, that would, that would be, that would affect you in a positive way, wouldn't it? Mm -hmm. To, to see him come in. But I can imagine someone saying about uh, to Barnabas about Saul, something like, I can't believe you're associating with him. How could, how do you, how dare you bring him in among us, you know, but no doubt Barnabas had good and positive things to say about him to help facilitate his uh, being accepted into the, to the members there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I called that one champion the misunderstood. Yeah, because um, in that particular text in Acts nine, if you go back a verse earlier than where you started, verse twenty six says, "When mm -hmm. he that is Saul came to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples." Yeah, I mean it just doesn't get much plainer than that, and we can equate that with similar situations today. You know, he, I mean, not that there was a martyr among us, but I mean a persecutor among us. Yeah. He tried to join the disciples, but they were all afraid of him, not believing that he really was a disciple. Mm -hmm. And as you say, it was their perception of him. And, and Barnabas was able to, to see him for who God intended him to be, for who God had transformed him into being. And he helped other people see him the same way. He helped other people see Saul the way God Saul, Saul. And yeah. so as you were saying, you know, he facilitated that. He made that easier for other people. He championed the misunderstood. Mm -hmm. There was a, <clears throat> a woman who came to a congregation that we were a part of, and she was different and 
quirky and unusual. You know, sometimes John and I say that to each other, we'll say, yeah, they're just quirky. And then we say that so often we think maybe we're the quirky ones. It's not, it's not that person. (laughs) We're the ones that are quirky. Why can't everybody be normal like us? Yeah, exactly. But, you know, some people just have kind of a somewhat abrasive way about them and it makes it harder for other people to accept them. Mm -hmm. But sometimes I think that abrasiveness is, is like a, a defense mechanism because maybe they've been rejected in other places. And so when they come into a new place, they have this wall that they've built up. And, and um, anyway, I came to find that she was just as good and sweet and genuine and would give you literally would take her shirt off and give it to you if she thought you needed it. And it really just took, I'm, and I'm not patting myself on the back here because I had to learn the lesson the hard way too, but it just took us embracing her and not literally because she wasn't a huggy type person, but just, you know, standing next to her in the church building and having a conversation with her and then drawing other people in and help helping others to see. And sometimes, you know, you can even talk about them behind their backs in a good way, of course, but just say things like, you know what, this good thing that she did and just, I don't know, maybe normalizing is a way of saying it, normal, normalize them and, and say, say things like, look, this, she's a sister to us. And, and maybe she doesn't think just like you do, but the ways that she thinks are just as valid and just as important as the ways that so-and-so thinks, you know? So I guess that's kind of what comes to mind, even though this sister was obviously not a persecutor like Saul was, but, um, but sometimes we just have to make things happen and we have to facilitate things. Well, and in this case, you know, it wasn't that Saul was quirky or, an odd duck or, you know, he was, he looked different from everybody else. He really did have a reputation Mm -hmm. and he really did do some horrible things and, you know, horrible things with names attached to them, not some vague, you know, in a far country, far, far away, these horrible Mm -hmm. things happen, but brothers and sisters of the way, you know, and in Christ that he, persecuted very seriously. And when you mm-hmm. read about the things that he had done and been, you know, a part of, it would be hard to get over something like that. Yeah. And you think about how protective you feel anyway of the Lord's church, you know, those are your people, those are God's mm-hmm. people. And here's somebody that was specifically targeting them. Yeah. And so everybody knows that about him. Everybody knows that that's who he was. Mm-hmm. And so here he, he's been changed. He's been transformed. He's met Christ, you know, and now he has a different mission. He just needs somebody to believe in him. And that person was Barnabas mm-hmm. and everybody. So think about those kinds of people that we know, we know their past. We know their horrible decisions. Maybe we even know that they've hurt people. Maybe it's people that we love and know personally. Mm-hmm. And then to be an encourager or to be a Barnabas, have the faith that people do want to change and can change and that Christ can make a difference in their life to the extent that you're going to grab hold of them and bring them in. To me, that's mm-hmm. the huge challenge because, you know, ment- we might mentally say, okay, <laughs> I mean, if they're a Christian now, fine, I'll believe it when I see it, but okay, yeah. but that doesn't necessarily mean I'm going to put them around my people or Mm -hmm. that I feel like I have to spend time with them, but we do. And that's what's so remarkable about Barnabas is he saw him and he believed what Christ did for him Mm -hmm. and believed his heart change and then made it easier for other people to see that and give him a chance. Yeah. But it's not just that he had compassion on Saul. He had courage because everybody could have, like you said, turned and looked at him and said, what are you doing? Mm -hmm. You know, why are you siding with him? Why are you thinking that we need to embrace him and bring him into our ranks and, you know, join him to us to work alongside him. And I just can't even imagine literally what it would have been like for him 
but I can see similar situations for us mm-hmm. with people that we know that have had some things in their past that they wish they could go back and undo and they can't, Right. but they can be new in Christ and should be given that second chance or third or fourth from us. Yeah. I was even thinking that it, it, I can't remember the timeline, but it was a, it was a good while before he went to Jerusalem after his conversion. I want to say at least a couple of years, mm-hmm. and maybe even more. So there had been time for them to hear that he had made a change. But, you know, again, maybe they were just saying, well, I'll, I'll believe it when I see it. And even when they saw it, they weren't maybe, and we don't know, we're extrapolating some of it, but I, I can just see, I mean, obviously it says that he tried to join the disciples, but we don't know what that exactly looked like. But I just think, who who is it that we need to take hold of mm-hmm. in our sphere? And it, it you know, of course, is going to be in the church, but there's other places where we need to shine our light and, and take hold of people and, and bring them into our circle and, um, and help them to be accepted and help them to be known and loved. And, um, you know, just made me start thinking of who are the ones that we need to take hold of. And I think there's, there's so many, I I just jotted down things, things like people who are older than me. And when I think of that, I think of the, little old ladies. And I say that because I know lots of them, but my mom is one now. And, um, uh, last week, right before we left Denver, Mike Bessel was doing a short course and he was teaching, I think it was a homiletics class, but he asked, and I know you did this when you were there. He asked Lynn and Terry and me and Kathy Petrillo to come in and had some questions to ask us in front of the students. And of course, most of them are men, but he wanted to know um, several things like, have we ever been at his point was here's uh, here's these four women. He was, he was saying this to the guys, here's these four women with about 150 years of experience and maybe they're not utilized as much. And one of the questions he asked is what would you like to say to these guys? And, And I said, get to know the older women in your congregation because they're a wealth of knowledge and they, they, they have so much experience and so much love and so much um, to offer that we, we just tend to gloss over them and not get to know them. And I, I think of how younger women, younger men, any of us can take hold of those widows of those older women. And they don't have to be widows, obviously, but take hold of them and and help to to bring them in and make them know how important they are and help them to have a place. You know, that, I just think that's one way that we can be a Barnabet is by um, taking hold of the older ones and the younger ones too, younger women. I th- think of the ones that had such an influence on me that, especially when I was a young wife, you know, early twenties and older women and at that time, they were probably my age that took an interest in me and knew my name and talked to me and and treated me like a peer rather than just a younger woman. So older than us, younger than us, the outcast, you know, someone who um, it, even if it's just someone that's new, and we don't know them. I think that they probably sometimes feel like an outcast, someone that's gossiped about. And that happens. And we can put a stop to that, but we can, we can bring them in to the circle. And again, I, I jotted down quirky because that's somebody I always think about that when we mm-hmm. think about bringing people in. So take hold of those people. Well, then, and uh, go ahead. At the end of that verse, another thing I highlighted was it says, so Saul stayed with them. It had sticking power. You know, I just love mm-hmm. it. And Barnabas Barnabas took hold of him and brought him to the disciples. And then so Saul stayed with them and moved about freely in Jerusalem, speaking boldly in the name of the Lord. Yeah. Yeah. That's the fruit of it. And what not, you know, I'm not saying that it's just because of Barnabas. I'm sure Saul would have done that anyway. Mm -hmm. But like you say, he facilitated that he had a part in that and definitely made it easier for God to use Paul now Mm -hmm. in his kingdom. And really 
think about the impact that Saul had because of the reputation that he had had before. And people probably, I mean, he likely they were like, let's go check out what this guy has to say that used to be in complete opposition to the people he is mm-hmm. hanging around with now. Right. Yeah. So um, <laughs> that, that had to yeah. be a, a big deal. Um, bringing, so, so Barnabas took hold, he brought Saul to the, to the apostles. Um, and I looked at the meaning of that word. And one of the, the definitions that, that I came across was to speak on behalf of. So um, I think that that's another thing, obviously, that that uh, Barnabas did for Saul. He spoke on behalf of him and and helped others to accept him. And then um, then I wrote down the word he saw. And I have to go back and look and and um, I'm not I can't find where exactly I saw this word, but he saw meaning, you know, somebody will say, I see you. Mm-hmm. In other words, I understand you. I'm looking. I, I can see what's going on. I, I am. Uh, I care about what's happening to you. And I think that this is something that that Barnabas did. When we see see people for for what they have going on in their lives and and what they might be experiencing and how they might be feeling, I think that that's one way that we really can encourage others. And I just wrote these things down. See the one who messed up. But instead of seeing how they messed up, see the forgiven one. And this is something that has struck me in the past, how maybe someone confesses a fault or you know something about them. They've confessed to you personally, or, you know, maybe you've just heard through the grapevine or, you know, for whatever reason, you know, something that they've messed up in the past. And I mean, I've been here before and I feel like those who know that, that thing about me, that's what I feel like they remember about me mm-hmm. is the one that messed up. They remember my fault. They remember my sin. And I, I want them to remember the forgiven me. And I, I really think that they do for the most part, because I know, you know, when preacher's wives, you know, people come to you and they, they, they confess things and they need to, they need counsel or they just need someone to listen to them. And I forget what they've confessed to me. And I don't think about that anymore. I see a brand new person and it's not like I'm looking at someone going, Oh, I remember you messed up and you're forgiven. And I remember that you're forgiven. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying, put that behind. Don't, don't look at someone with eyes that remember the fault in the past, but look at someone as, as God looks at them and God forgets, forgives and forgets hard for us to do, but see the one who messed up as a forgiven one. See uh, the one who is, is sorrowing over something and sit down and cry with them. And, you know, Job's friends sat with him for a week for all their faults. They, they sat with him for a week, cry with them, see the one who's rejoicing and be happy with them. See the one that's introverted and just sit quietly with them. (laughs) You know, I know that you and I both are introverts Uh, and sometimes you can get around someone who's extroverted and doesn't it just wear you out? And I don't mean that in a bad way, but sometimes I'm just like drained after I've been with someone who's happy, happy, happy. And I, again, I don't, I hope that doesn't come across wrong. I know you, you know what I mean? It's just, I feel like, you know, I love their bubbliness and everything, but I want to try to match it and it's hard. So if you know someone who's introverted, just sit quietly with them and, and help to uh, keep them from being drained. I hope that I'm going to, I'm going to regret saying that. I'm sure. No, you're not. Okay. 95% of our listeners probably relate to that. <laughs> yeah. Well, except for the extroverts out there that are going, what's wrong with her? What? Yeah. I do not get that. Maybe we drain them. Do you think? Probably. <laughs> How no, is that bore, possible though? We bore them. That's what. <laughs> <laughs> that's what's draining is boring them. <sighs> and then I just have a couple others that I've jotted down. See the struggling one. See someone who is struggling. And and I think this takes a little bit of um, talent. I don't know if talent is the right word, but when you can, when you see someone and you can, 
into it, what is it that they need right now? Do they need for me to hold their hand? Do they just need to sit next to them? Do they want to talk about it? Do they not want to talk about it? You know, I've been with both kinds of people and some of us, you know, and I'm one of them. Sometimes you just, you feel like you just need to talk to cover the awkward silence, but really what they need is just someone to sit with you, you know? Um, And then see the lost. And I don't mean only the lost spiritually, but someone who's just adrift and doesn't know what's next and help them find their way back or just ground them, you know, help them to, to be in reality, hold on to them. And, you know, maybe that's part of, of what Barnabas did. Um, see the mamas that are out there in, in the pews that need help and sit next to them and help them. Anyway, there's, those were several things. And, and um, God commands us to be encouragers, 1 Thessalonians 4.18 and 1 Thessalonians 5.11 um, and Hebrews 3.13. Those are all, that'll be people's homework. They can look those up and see how God commands encouragement. So do you have anything to add to that? Because I wanted us to talk about practical ways of encouragement. Well, I, I put see others. Okay. So we just both pulled the exact same thing mm-hmm. from the verses. And the only other thing I'll add to that is that it is an other's mentality. You know, if you want to be an encourager, you can't be self-absorbed yeah. and always focusing on your needs, your wants, or your whatever. And, mm. you know, but to develop an other's mentality that even sees other people where they are, what they're going through what they need, as you were saying, to be able to encourage them. It starts with that. It starts with this others mentality and seeing others. So that's all I'll add to that. Yeah. Well, speaking of that saying, I see you, um, this was something that I was, I just thought was so sweet this week when we were at Jacob and Alyssa's, someone came to the door. I was sitting outside with the baby and I didn't hear the doorbell. But Jake came out and told me that the parents, some of their dearest friends live in Chicago and he's a, has a Chick-fil-A up there. And, but his parents live in the Fort Worth area. And so they brought on behalf of Jake's friend, um, a gift. And one of them was those, you know, those, uh, street taco kits that you could get at Sam's or Costco. It's just Mm -hmm. a meal kit. So they brought them that, but they also brought, he sent Jacob, Jake, he goes by Jake, but I could still call him Jacob, 20 boxes of 20 big boxes of cinnamon toast crunch because they've gone on several vacations together. And anytime they do, they, they go to the grocery store and Jake buys a giant box of cinnamon toast crunch. And that's kind of his guilty pleasure, I guess, (laughs) but it was symbolic of um, the, they're in this, they, they have a, a franchise called Skyrun. It's a, a property management. And so they sign cabins to, to join their Skyrun property management. And they just signed their 20th cabin. So oh, Jake's wow. friend sent him 20 boxes of cinnamon toast crunch to congratulate him for that. But also that it was really cute, but this same friend, he and his wife, the, the previous miscarriage that Alyssa had, they sent a painting to them that had, you could tell it was a family of four and, you know, the baby that they lost was like being held by Jesus. And on the back of it, they had written, we see you more family of four. Mm -hmm. And it just was so touching to me, you know, because Mm -hmm parents do that. You know, we, as parents, we try to encourage and try to lift up and, and, um, just give them comfort, but to know that they have good friends that do these things for them. And I thought that that, you know, we see you, they knew that they were, they're grieving and sorrowing over that miscarriage. And, and, you know, so that to me, um, Hunter and Jessica are the names of the friends of, of Jake and Liz and, Obviously they are, they wept with them when they wept and they are rejoicing with them when they rejoice too. So practical ways, I thought we would just kind of try to give some practical ways of, of encouraging. And, um, so did you write some of these down or do you no, want me to just I, go through my list? Yeah, I, I, I guess I should 
I don't think this fits on your practical. So I'm just going to share it here. A couple of the other okay. things that I thought of were um, be glad because um, the text says that, which one was it? Um, in Acts 11, news of this reached the church in Jerusalem and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. And when he arrived and saw what the grace of God had done, he was glad and encouraged them all to remain true to the Lord with all their hearts. Mm -hmm. And that's when it goes on to say, he was a good man, full of the spirit and faith. A great number of people were brought to the Lord. So, um, again, I just kept thinking about how his mentality of seeing good things, you know, um, turned him into that encourager yeah. and he saw the good. He was looking for the good and he pointed it out and, you know, he credited God and he saw the grace of the Lord at work in people's lives and the potential mm -hmm. for that in people's lives. And so not just in others mentality, but that positive outlook of being glad and seeing God at work. If you're looking for those things, you'll see them, you'll point them out mm -hmm. And you'll encourage those in others, you know, yeah. and, and you'll want to, you know, mm -hmm. there's no sense of um, competition or jealousy or envy, just gladness. Mm -hmm. And that was a part of who he was. And then the other one that I had was have faith in others. And you kind of alluded to that earlier with the whole scenario with John Mark and, um, you know, Paul, ironically, <laughs> yeah. needed is the one that needed a break from him. But Barnabas still wanted to give him the the second chance. He still saw his usefulness and purpose. And so um, the way he showed that was, <clears throat> and maybe this is a practical one. He asked uh, John Mark to join him in the work. So have faith in others by asking them to join you in your work. You know, whatever it is, however mm -hmm. you're serving um, whether it's in ministry or day-to-day -day service and other Christians look for people to show them that you have faith in them mm -hmm. wherever they are in their walk by inviting them to participate in that work with you. Yeah. And, um, and I think that's why he was an encourager. So now. I think it takes effort to, to see or not, well, effort for sure, but it, it takes um, training our minds to see. Mm -hmm what you're talking about. And, um, cause uh, I think a lot of us naturally don't, we just don't, we don't look outside ourselves enough to see, uh, what others need us to see and how we can uh, encourage others. We're just so internal most of the time. Mm -hmm. I know, um, I know I have been that way and I've tried to get out of that, but it just, it's just a selfishness that we, I think we're maybe born that way. And we just have to realize that we're that way and we have to get ourselves out of it. Well, it's all around help. us. It's all around yeah. us. You know, mm -hmm. we're, we're almost programmed that way, not by God, but by the world yeah. and the things that we see and hear and read. And, you know, it's, it's, you have to develop a completely, uh, a Colossians three, one and two mindset. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hey, that sounds familiar. Hey, that should be our theme. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it should. So I, like I need to interrupt this podcast. We interrupt this podcast. <laughs> so I have been, been smelling stinky feet. What in the since, world? Since I came over here and set up, I set up my, my laptop like I always do. And I went to put my headphones on like I always do. And I thought, I smell stinky feet. And I thought, is it my headphones? I mean, it's been a while since I've So I was sniffing my headphones, but they smell fine. And then, um, you know, I'm sitting here talking check your to you. Feet? And I'm, it's not my feet. And I'm going, is it on my, is there something on my hands? I'm smelling my hands. No, my hands don't smell like stinky feet. It just dawned on me what I'm smelling. <laughs> I'm afraid to ask. So yesterday, yesterday I kept seeing all these flies around the windows. Mm -hmm. I mean, crazy, like almost like scary movie flies, you know, and I started looking at ways to get rid of flies. And one suggestion was to put out a bowl of apple cider vinegar with some dish detergent in it, you know, to attract the flies and kill them. And so there is a bowl of apple cider vinegar over there in the corner. I can't see it from here. <laughs> so I forgot about it. And I'm so it yesterday? yesterday afternoon and I am so relieved, but I'm closer to it when I came up here and set up everything for the podcast. I'm just sitting across, I'm right across from it, but I just forgot it was there. And so all this time I'm like, why does my house smell like stinky feet? <laughs> <clears throat> what am I smelling? 
And I'm just now, I feel like I just needed to share that because I'm so relieved that I have figured out what it is. It's not me. It's not my headphones. It's this bowl of apple cider vinegar, which I, I never equated to stinky feet before, but it has dawned on me that that's exactly what it smells like. Are there dead flies in it? No, it does not work. There is not a single dead fly in there. Well, are there dead flies around the window? Uh, the ones that I've swatted, yes. They're supposed to land on it. Oh, huh? it's supposed to trap them or is they're, it supposed yeah, to repel them? Yeah, they're supposed to be attracted to the smell of the apple cider vinegar. And then when they land on it, the dish soap does something that kills them. Oh, okay. Well, maybe so. they fly off and die. <laughs> It's like maybe. a delayed response. Maybe death. so, but I was really hoping to see a bowl full of dead flies floating around in there, but alas. It probably would smell different. Anyway, I know we were having this very back to encouragement, serious, Kathy. serious conversation. Yes. So Can't we take now you return anywhere. to our scheduled podcast. <laughs> okay. Practical ways to encourage. Mm -hmm. Okay. So one of the things that I wrote down, I have to kind of give a shout out to my husband because he is to me a very good encourager of people. And one of the ways that he does that is by, and you know, this, he, he likes to get people to talk about themselves. Mm -hmm. And one of the ways that he does that is the very first thing that he asks about them is where are you from? I mean, we, everywhere we go and my boys would laugh if they could hear this because uh, that's the first thing he'll say is now, where are you from? And he says it just like that. Now, where are you from? Sometimes he'll insert, he'll go rogue and say, in like insert the word originally, where are you originally from? Ooh. And, you know, it's a, it's a great way to get people talking about themselves and it's uh, you know, people just, they like that. And it kind of gets the ball rolling and opens the door and makes them, puts them at ease. And mm -hmm. the one time I was really uncomfortable, well, it's been more than once, but one time I was really uncomfortable in an airport in Germany when we went through um, security and he had a knife in his backpack and it was an illegal knife in Germany. It was one of those that has a button and it, not a switchblade, but it, it, it did something and it was illegal there. And so they pulled him aside and then they called the police over there. I mean, German police. Yes. And he, John starts asking him now, where are you from? Like, John, <laughs> do not do that to the police in Germany. They're going to think that you're like stalking them or trying to figure out how you can get anyway. It was OK. That's a side note. But anyway, you can ask people where they're from, how they got to know each other. I think just being interested in people is the is the point. Mm -hmm. He is very uh, good at that. He's yeah, a, he is. He's a he good en encourager of others. He engages people. Mm -hmm. Another way. And, and I this was something that you said to me. When we said goodbye in wherever we were, where we said goodbye in Rome, I guess. And the last thing you said to me is, I'm proud of you. Yeah. And it was just, I thought, man, your parents tell you that, you know, but does your friend tell you that? And I thought, I've got to write that down and remember that because it just meant the world to me. And maybe you didn't know because we were kind of in a hurry and we sort of had a rushed goodbye, didn't know that it was going to be, you know, anyway, mm. when you said, I'm proud of you, that was very, maybe it seems strange to think of that as being encouraging, but it did because you, you were just telling me that, that what we, I mean, it made me feel like what we do is valuable and important. And so I think tell your friends that you're proud of them and that that can be encouraging. Mm. It was encouraging to me. So thank you. Yeah. Um, I was trying to think of some other people that I've noticed before that do encouraging things. And there's a woman, her name is Jody Randall. She's a part of the Bear Valley congregation and she's a kind of a behind the scenes does some neat things. Like she took Karen Watson to get a rescue dog after Karen's oh. husband died. Mm -hmm. She took her to the, to the, not to the pound, but to the animal society, whatever and helped her to get a dog. And she's always doing things for the older women at Bear Valley. She hosts luncheons and things. And I, I just know that she does things for them at Christmas. So um, doing behind the scenes things are important. Mm -hmm. And I know lots of people do those and things that I don't know about because they're behind the scenes. Um, what about when someone comes forward? You know, that's kind of a tradition that we have when they come forward and they 
you tend to think of it as, you know, I hate to say it because it's, it's probably a really bad way of putting it, but the, the walk of shame that we tend to think of, that's really not a walk of shame. It's a walk of bravery and of courage, but sometimes we feel like it's shameful. And I've always felt like, why, why can't we go back? You know, maybe in some places they do have the elders at the back and that's, I'm digressing, I know, but if the elders stood at the back and people would maybe feel more comfortable to go and ask for help or ask for prayers or support or whatever. But anyway, when someone comes forward, go and sit with them. And I've seen this done several places. I know at university in San Marcos, uh, they're so good. It's like you can't fit people on that aisle, that front seat, yeah, because there's that. so many people mm-hmm. that go with them and and sit down and hold their hand and, and, you know, just basically offering support and encouragement. And I think we need that. Mm-hmm. Um, card writing. And I think when we, you're good at this, you, you're such a good thank you note writer and card writer. And, but I think when we do write cards, being specific about things that we say in there, like, this is what I love about Mm -hmm. you. Who wouldn't want to get a card like that? Mm -hmm. You know, to have somebody say, I love this about you. That's a good idea. Yeah. Um, And you and I talked about this before too, pray with people Mm -hmm. and not, you don't just say, I'm going to pray for you, but grab their hand right then and do it. And it, it takes a little, especially at first, it takes some courage. And, you know, if you, if you self doubt, like I do all the time, you're thinking to yourself, would they want me to, they want, maybe they don't want me to hold their hand. Should I just do it? I mean, it's a, it's a good thing to do regardless of whether you might think someone wants you to or not. People always need prayer. Then I thought of some practical things like, why not pull your neighbor's trash can in and not just yours? Do something for someone. Pull their trash can in. Um, What about leaving post-it notes in your husband's briefcase or, um, I don't know, I used to do it sometimes in my kids' lunch boxes, but trying to think, I think of uh, John and Laura Warren's and their, um, their post-it notes of encouragement. He calls it something else. I can't remember off the top of my head, but where else could you leave a post-it note? Maybe even on the the mirror at the church building, but how would you do it, you know, specifically for someone? Maybe just stick it in their purse. In the ladies restroom? Yeah. Looking good, girl. <laughs> <laughs> You could put a post-it note on the mirror that says, remember to pull, not to walk out of the bathroom with your (laughs) skirt skirt. tucked in your pantyhose. (laughs) (laughs) No, I didn't mean put a post-it note in the purse in the bathroom, but you know, in their, like drop it in their purse when you walk by. Okay. That might be a little creepy. (laughs) I don't know. I wouldn't mind it. There's there's potential there. You can massage that one. Okay. I got to work on that one. Okay. What about writing thank you cards to your elders? Mm-hmm. That's a really good one. Because, you know, 99% of the time, I think they get complaints mm-hmm. or you should do it this way or why don't y'all do it this way? But why not just send them a thank you card? Because, you know, when we're at Bear Valley and we're um, basically live in the parking lot there and you see how often the elders cars are there and how often they're meeting. Mm-hmm. And um, so they spend a lot of time and a lot of heartache and a lot of tears. They need to know that we appreciate them. What about a thank you note to your mother-in-law? Mm-hmm. Who wouldn't, what mother-in-law wouldn't want to do that? Want to get that? Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I would. Um, I noticed when we went to see Darcy the first time at the hospital, Alyssa had made goodie bags for the nurses. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I know. And Erin has done that. I know I remember, and she probably still does, but she and her mom used to always go um, Black Friday shopping. Mm -hmm. They would go Thanksgiving night when I'm like sitting down going, I can't even think about going anywhere. They get up and go Mm -hmm. and uh, get some really great deals. That was just kind of their thing, but she Mm -hmm. would make goodie bags for the clerks and would always have a little verse on there and, and say something like, we appreciate you. And it was just a little simple something, but, Mm -hmm. but I always thought that that's probably one of the best things that they'll get 
this year is just to, yeah. I've never heard that, anybody doing that. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. Here's a tip <laughs> for men. If they want to encourage their wives, clean the toilet and the floor around the toilet. That's just a side note for all of the men, amen, all of our amen. huge male audience. Yeah. <laughs> but who, I mean, come on. Huge male audience. <laughs> <laughs> so is that mean huge male audience <laughs> or lots of male audience? <laughs> I've heard it both ways. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, moving right along. You're supposed uh, to jump in here. I'm like, you've got a list going. I don't want to interrupt a list. Well, feel free to interrupt. Um, I read this the other night. Uh, somebody, I can't remember the story, but someone, um, I think they had lost a family member, and their friend called them and said, "Are you home?" And the person said, yeah, we are. And they said, okay, your doorbell is going to ring in about 15 minutes. Make sure you answer it. Mm -hmm. And it was Instacart and they had sent what they called grief groceries. Oh, and it was, you know, bags full of, um, Oreos and Kleenex and ice cream and, you know, things that they probably would need too for when, when you have family coming in, like yeah. toilet paper or uh, paper K cups, mm -hmm. paper goods, things like that. Yeah. But, you know, you tend to think I, well, I, I could, I'd, I would bring them that stuff if I was there, but I'm not there. So I can't. Mm -hmm. So there's places like Instacart mm -hmm. that will go do the shopping for you and take it and you pay a fee, but I mean, what a great thing yeah. to do. And That's then there's great. DoorDash and Uber Eats, mm -hmm. things like that, that you can send a meal mm -hmm. or a cupcake or something like that to someone. It doesn't have to be someone that's grieving, but someone who is um, celebrating or mm -hmm. just to say, I love you. And, you know, these are this list of ways to encourage are not necessarily spiritual ways of encouraging, but but I think that it, it all has to do with that because we're, we're wanting to encourage others. And, and I think remembering that the reason why we're encouraging others is to, to shine the light, you know, shine the light of Jesus to, to other people. So um, babysitting is something that we can do. And I think that there's a lot of young couples in congregations that don't have family nearby. And so we can step in and, and help out with that and offer a, a night off, you know, just a, a night for parents to have off. I think another way we can encourage is to compliment parents on their parenting. You know, when you see someone mm -hmm. who's, yeah. and we've been there, we know what it's like going through parenting mm -hmm. and you're doubting yourself all of the time, or you're exhausted or you're, frustrated or whatever feeling you're feeling you, you we've been there but just to say hey you know what you're doing a good job and it's this is going to get better and mm -hmm. you're you're not going to regret doing this you know things like that compliment parents on their parenting um something that i know is very encouraging to me and i need to do i need to be better about this is to learn people's names and use them when you're talking to them or when you see them, you know, a place at a, at a great big place, like polishing the pulpit or something, if you, maybe, you know, someone just through social media mm -hmm. and, and you know, what, why is it that we're like, they probably don't know who I am, so I'm not going to go approach them. But what if you walked over there and say, it said, Hey, Kathy, good to see you. I haven't never met you in person, you know, something like that. Or just walking by them and saying, hey, Kathy, just just using people's names. I think that makes them feel special and known and seen, you know, so don't make it creepy. Just just be encouraging and learn and learn and use people's names. Uh, I read this, too, if someone's grieving to to use their loved one's name and talk about them. Cause I, I don't know about you, but sometimes I think I don't want to bring them up because I don't want to cause them pain, yeah. you know, especially in a, and maybe this is something we need, can talk about at a different time, but especially in a setting in a public setting, like worship, when we are together at the church building and maybe they're barely holding it together 
And if you did say their loved one's name, it would just all come <laughs> apart. I don't know. Maybe someone can chime in on that and tell us how, how that, you know, maybe it'd be better to do it in a private setting or just call them and ask them to go to dinner or have coffee or something and, and say, I just want, I want us to talk about whoever it is. So I know I haven't really been in that position to know, but use their loved one's name and listen to them talk. This is something you've done for me. And I know I've learned it from you to, when you get together with someone, turn your phone off and when they, you know, in front of them, take your phone out, turn it off and put it down because that lets people know that this time that I'm spending with you is valuable. And it's kind of almost unheard of to not check your phone repeatedly. And I know sometimes we have to, depending on what's yeah. going on, mm -hmm. but turn your phone off and sit down and listen. I also read something about giving a toy, give, give someone a toy, <laughs> you know, an adult, maybe oh. it's just one of, yeah, not to just kids, but, um, like those little puzzles that are, um, brain teasers or, a a word, uh, word scramble book or Sudoku, 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 whatever that is. That mixed up. I know. I can't remember, but just give something fun to someone. Mm -hmm. S U D O K U, right? Sudoku. I, I think that's what it is. Something else that I thought of, if you see something, say something, you know, we hear that all the time with regard to, uh, if you see something uh, suspicious, you mm -hmm. should say something about it. What about if you see something good that somebody does? Why don't we say something about it? Praise them to the, to their face. Or, you know, this is a, one of those times when it would be good to say, Hey, you know what I, what I heard, Do you know what I saw mm -hmm. instead of it being something negative, let it be something positive. Kind of makes me <clears throat> think of that um, thing about don't save the accolades for after people die. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Why do we praise do that? Them. Yeah. Praise them and express the appreciation and goodness now to their face. Yeah. And yeah. Mm -hmm. At John's dad's funeral, I kept thinking he would have loved this, you know, because everybody's, he loved reminiscing mm -hmm. and, and telling old stories. And that's all his funeral was just a lot of telling old stories about him. He would have loved it. Mm -hmm. And I think we did, you know, we didn't wait until he died to do that, but it did make me think of, so don't wait until the funeral to say good things. Notice what people like and remember it and give gifts accordingly. Maybe, you know, somebody that likes a certain kind of coffee. And what if you just randomly went and got a bag of that coffee and gave it to them or what they collect, you know, something like that. And again, I sort of feel like I'm um, thinking carnally here with gifts and things like that when it comes to, you know, here's, here's Barnabas, the spiritual encourager, and here's Carla giving you these carnal th pieces of advice. But, but I think we can all tie it all together with being encouraging in, in the word and encouraging in, in our Christian life. What about when someone confides in you and follow up, you know, go and say, Hey, I've been praying for you. And is there any, anything else I can how, how can I help you in any other way, you know, follow up and check with them. Um, I, I knew I read this when the kids were little, that kids need 10 times more praise and criticism. And I think that that's true of everyone that we can make our minds think more of encouragement than of criticism. I have to train our minds to do it, but find things to praise people about rather than to criticize them. And it's funny you think about that praise you want to do to someone's face and criticism we do behind their back when really shouldn't be any of that. And uh, if we can't say it to their face, why would we say it at all? Um, go to someone's, a, a, a young person's football game or baseball game to encourage them. Give credit where credit is due. That's kind of one of my pet peeves is when someone does not do that. So anyway, those were just some things that i jotted down about encouraging just practical ways of encouraging others. And I know there's lots of others and maybe next week in the group, we can start a thread about how we can encourage one another. And maybe it would be good to have a spiritual encouragement too. The only, <clears throat> excuse me, the only group that I would add to that would be people who are single again, 
Yeah. Um, I think that a lot of times they could use some very specific encouragement. And I remember um, doing kind of a survey on that several years ago. And a woman who had, you know, been divorced um, said that her whole life changed as she knew it would, but it also changed her friendships with other people mm -hmm. because all of her friends were couples. Yeah. Just like she and her husband used to be. Mm -hmm. And then when she was no longer married, um, she said it just started feeling kind of awkward. Like people didn't invite her over to their house anymore. And, mm -hmm. you know, and so um, that's a scenario when, you know, maybe we can look for ways to specifically encourage them and uh, invite them to be a part of things or, you know, talk about it if they want to or not, or, you know, but yeah. um, I think initially when that divorce happens, which is, a, a sort of grieving, you know, in its own way. Um, everybody's there to walk them through it. And then when they're still trying to figure out life and this new identity and, and everything else, you know, they still need encouragement. So mm -hmm. that's the only one that I would add. And I was kind of yeah. thinking about the people I know that are encouragers, you know, when you, yeah. we know a lot of, we both know a lot of encouragers. I think mm -hmm. that's the beauty of being in the Lord's church anyway. Yeah. But when somebody like that's just really a word that describes them, it's such a standout quality that you can think of somebody's name right off the top of your head, mm -hmm. you know, and I have these names that just currently in my life just pop to the top of my head. And I've been thinking, what about them makes them that way? And mm -hmm. why is that something that I think of? <clears throat> why is their name what comes to my mind when I think of somebody being a Barnabas? And I think it all comes down to, in every single case, they may do it differently. You know, I think Neil is one of those people that um, he sees others and he points them out, mm -hmm. you know, and, and looks for things to praise. I think he's really good about that. I think about um, Russell Simpson, one of our elders, who is just so good about giving you his whole heart and he'll come up and tell you that, yeah. you know, have I told you today that I love you mm -hmm. and God has blessed us with you. I mean, he just, he means it sincerely and he just is not afraid to tell you, you know, mm -hmm. and, um, or people who they'll come up to you and say, you know, I was thinking about that time that you, and they just bring up some random thing that you don't think anything of, but they're always bringing it to your attention, you mm -hmm. know, what you mean to them or, and what they all have in common is a, just a genuine interest in people. Yeah. And, which is as, as believers, as followers of Christ, that's really what life is all about is a genuine interest in people. And, you know, I think some people are especially gifted at being encouragers. You're one of those people, mm -hmm. you know, how those things that you were reading of examples that, you know, thought of a really like the, the kitty bags for the nurses in the hospital, never in a million years would I have thought of that but you probably would have, you know, you kind of have that knack. Um, but we can all be genuine, genuinely interested in people. And when we are, then we're going to naturally look for ways to encourage them. And, and at the end of it all, you know, um, isn't that going to help people see Christ? And mm -hmm. isn't that why we're here? And isn't that what it's all about to, yeah cause people to look up and see Christ. And so that the word of God can spread as it did when Barnabas encouraged Saul. Yeah. Great way to bring it back around. I wanted to read one more thing that, um, that I had looked up. I was just kind of looking at some different ways to, <laughs> to encourage spiritually. And there was one thing that I read that said, reorient your perspective. And it says encouraging people doesn't have to be difficult, but it does take intentionality. It also requires a different mindset in the way we approach people in social settings. Take social media, an industry that thrives on getting people to ask the question, how can I get others to notice me today? A spirit of encouragement flips that question on its head by mm -hmm. asking, how can I bless others through this platform? That's something you and I've talked about a lot, like mm -hmm. rather than social media using us, how can we use it? Because you hear people mm -hmm. slamming social media all the time. And I think, you know, there's so many ways that we can use it 
to mm-hmm. accomplish Christ's purposes and to point others to him. And she went on to say, consider the workplace where self-promotion is often seen as key to climbing the ladder of success. Instead of asking, how can I get the chain of command to recognize my accomplishments and skills? An encourager approaches work with a servant's mindset that says, how can I help others here feel valued and achieve their best? In this way, this is the main thing, Christ honoring encouragement flows from a transformed heart. Unlike flattery or lip service that has the appearance of godliness, but comes instead from self-serving interests. So it's what we're trying to do is honor Christ in our thoughts, in our words, in our actions, our deeds, our um, interactions with other people. And so I think just being conscious and being aware of everything that we say and do can encourage others or discourage others. And it's so easy for us to not be conscious of that and things that happen are going to be discouraging. So let's work on our hearts and our yeah. minds and try to encourage in, in, in every, every aspect of our life. That made me think about how they used to call them snipers, you know, people on social media that just mm-hmm. always have something negative to say <clears throat> and their comments going to stir up strife or controversy or, or whatever, you know, and they're just, it's like, they're just trolling and going, do, 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 do. Mm-hmm. but turn that around like you were saying and just do the exact opposite and how many people can you bless how many people Mm -hmm. can you just say a word or two here and there um to make them feel encouraged uplifted seen worthy valuable you know in just a few minutes time yep you could really do that do you have um something good i know you're i do oh i do too okay good i I, i've thought of it right before i left the house so you go first Okay. Mine is a poem that Neil wrote several years ago. And I thought it kind of went with our our topic today because it's called, he can carry what's too heavy for you. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm just going to read it real quick, but I wanted to share it because if you go to the link where he shared it, he also in that article um, includes a link to a song that was written by Jeff Wyant, who, Mm -hmm. you know, because he's a member at Bear Valley, Mm -hmm. um, who when he became a Christian a few years ago or several years ago now, um, he started writing songs and they're Mm -hmm. really beautiful. And he actually has a YouTube page um, where he sings all the parts. He has the music and sings all the parts to all these songs that he's written, but Neil includes one of them. And the song that by Jeff that he includes is won't you come, which is absolutely beautiful and will make you cry but anyway Mm. here's uh neil's poem he can carry what's too heavy for you we struggle and strain to carry our load we buckle as it gets heavier on our backs we fall and hurt on this rough rocky road the weight makes us stop in our tracks looking around with a face full of pleading we wonder who's observing our pain we're wounded weary broken and bleeding set to surrender from the stress and strain tears flow freely we've been here before. We know how the journey seems endless. Certain we can't make it alone to the door. We feel solitude, helpless, and friendless. It's bigger than us, crushing and enormous, and the content's shameful and unsightly. We've borne it so long, it's begun to conform us to a stooped struggler holding on tightly. A voice calling gently, bring it over to me. I can help you and give you my best. Your burden is heavy. I know you are weary. Come to me and I will give you rest. Could you double down, wincing and worn, grit your teeth and ignore his free aid? Eventually it will bury you after making you mourn. You know an exorbitant price must be paid. He is willing and able, excuse me, but waiting for you to seek what he offers you without reservation. Let him do for you what only he can do. Give your burdens to Christ with no hesitation. Think of the journey partnered with one, capital O, without limits and power, purity and pity. He will stay with you until your journey is done as together you arrive at his heavenly city. So he can carry what's too heavy for you. So I'm going to share the link because Mm. you go and read that. And then you listen to this song Mm. that Jeff Wyant wrote and it's just beautiful. And it's perfect for, you know, if, if any of us ever need encouragement when we feel like we're just struggling or, or burdened, or if you know someone who's really going through a difficult time right now, send this to send this link Mm. to them. Yeah. And um, I think it'll really give them some encouragement. It's a great idea. 
By the way, Jeff has a brand new song that he he taught us right before we left, which is my favorite of all his songs. Oh. I didn't know he had a YouTube channel. I'm wondering if he has the new one. He must have put it on there because he did the, you know, play taught us each the, mm-hmm. the uh, each of the parts. So maybe that one I can link mm-hmm. to next week. Well, mine is a recipe. Okay. And this was something that um, Alyssa had, had lots of ingredients and things. She was ultra prepared for the baby, but this was something that she had left for me to cook while she was there. It's called crock pot, brown sugar, and balsamic glazed pork tenderloin. And it sounds fancy, but it was super, super easy. Mm. It's just um, sage and salt, pepper, and garlic rubbed on the pork tenderloin and crock pot for eight hours on low. And then you make a glaze with the brown sugar, cornstarch, balsamic vinegar, and some soy sauce. And then you Mm. put it under the broiler for a few minutes and shred it. And we had tacos with that last night and it was delicious. And I am 100% going to make it again. So I'll put the recipe in the group next week. Yeah, that sounds so good. That does not surprise me that she did that. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. She's amazing. She is. I got me some good girls. Yes, you do. And they're yeah. all amazing and very likable. Yeah. You know, some people can just be amazing and not likable, but yeah, that's true. I never thought about that, but you're right. <laughs> well, good conversation. And yes, um, I love getting back in our routine. And, me too. Um, it's been too long. It has. It has. And I um, loved your comments, what you had to say. And I know that you are, you excel at encouragement and in, in just being a friend and helping others to look up which is you know what we're trying to do here is to point others to keep looking up so until next time keep looking up thank you and i love you talk to you soon all right bye-bye